higher at Plymouth Cordage Museum in North Plymouth on Court Street. And we're in, I've got Charlie Williams. Uh, Charlie is the treasurer of the Plymouth Cordage Museum. He's also a 20 year former employee of Plymouth Cordage Industries. Charlie, how are you? Good. Good, thank you for allowing me to come down and introduce you. Um, anybody that's been around North Plymouth, um, heading up to Kingston the Highway, heading downtown, you can't help but come by here and wonder what this large expanse of buildings is. And even back then, there was much, there were quite a few more buildings that are there now. Let's um, let's talk about Plymouth and um, what is it about this uh, park, this um, the museum here? What what went on in Plymouth? Uh, cordage Company. Well, the Plymouth Cordage Company was the largest maker of rope uh, in the world. Started back in 1824 uh, when Bourne Spooner, after an apprenticeship down in New Orleans, came back to Plymouth. Now, was he a Plymouth? He was originally a Plymouth. He was a Plymouth native. Right. Okay. Plymouthian. He was what? He was a Plymouth. Plymouthian. All right. <laughs> Uh, he came back and decided he could make rope with uh, paid labor as opposed to slave labor, which was common down in the Louisiana area. Right. So he uh, convinced several investors in the South Shore to uh, invest in his enterprise and in 1824. He was an abolitionist. Yes, he was. Came back up here. So, so in 1824, he... Uh, started a small rope walk on what was known as Nathan's Brook, which is uh, fed by Store Pond across the uh, way from us now. And uh, eventually it grew into one of the longest rope walks in the world. This was at the time? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's all been taken down, although there was a, there's a small section of it down at Mystic Seaport. That's correct. That was they moved down there. Just mantled it very carefully, and marked every Every nail, nail and board and everything else. Pin. And, uh, took it down and reassembled it there, and it's uh, pretty much as it was. Really? Right. Except shorter. All the, <laughs> all the employees could go down there and get back into their positions and right. start it right back right. up again if they right. were so inclined. So, this is one of, I guess, several, um, certainly the largest, but one of several rope walks in Plymouth. Right. Right. Back at that time, there were probably five or six of them, um, some down on the uh, what's Brewster Gardens now, uh, some who were on Brewster Street. And, and the Brewster Gardens looked a lot different back then. It was a big, yeah, yeah. Big, big delta, pond. Big, big pond. pond, yeah. Type of thing. Right. And it kind of went diagonally, as I recall, from uh, where the old movie theater is uh, across the. Uh, the pond and ended up at the uh, corner of Leiden Street. Now, where was the old movie theater? Which building was that? That's um, is that the one at the corner of Water. That no, that's the one up on Main Street, on Main Street Extension, which oh, is now an I think it's called a Landmark or an office building. Okay. Right next to Bruce the Garden. All right. That was the old uh, old Colony movie theater. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Loring started in 18, it's right here on the coast, because back then you had the ships. You had the ships. And why was, why was rope so important? What is it about, when you look back on it, it's like making rope. You don't think about how rope got made right. currently, but going back to the early 1800s, and I actually had probably a dozen of my ancestors at least as far back as my great great grandfather in Charlestown Navy Yard making rope. Right. You know, they were he was French, French German. Yep. Came out over here and that's what they did. Everybody needed rope. Well but why they, did but you had the tall ships uh, why did we need rope? Well you used it for the rigging, you used it for uh, trimming the sails, uh, strengthening the edge of sails, you used it for your standing rigging, your running rigging. Uh, Cables to, uh, you know, to tow with, uh, rope to tie the boat up, anchor line. Uh, it had other other reasons. I mean, you used rope and everything. You couldn't hoist anything right. without a rope. Right. You know, to tow it, to, to hoist it. Wagons. To, 
Correct. That's correct. All the Teamsters back then had to have plenty of rope. Right. Rope was uh, common in you know in that period of time, and it goes all the way back to you know the Egyptians. They used it. They used it for moving blocks. Moving blocks of uh, stone, I guess, up the uh, pyramids. Right. But uh, you know, whenever you tied anything together, you needed a rope type of uh, product. Right. Right. In, was it a hazardous industry back then? Or? No, I don't think I'd describe it as hazardous any more than any other industry was back then. Well, one thing, um, in my family anyways, um, a lot of them come down with lung issues. And I think it might have been because these... Uh, absolutely true. And they, uh, they work all year round. Yep. No matter what the temperature, they work. Well, the the cordage uh, back in those days, uh, they they would work. They would try to work from sun up to sun down, and uh, of course during the summer that became advantageous to the employee um, because the day was, uh, you know, was a little bit longer, and he made more money. But in the winter it became very short. Because if it got too cold, they wouldn't operate the rope walk. They if shut it, it down. If it too hot, they shut down. Right. So Plymouth right. probably paid more attention to that than some of the other rope works. Right. Um, they said they weren't unionized. They weren't then. at that time. No. 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 But the management of the factory, they were pretty, um, they were worker oriented. Very much. Yep. Very much. One of the first things they did in 1824 was build a, uh, I think it was a six tenement uh, building for uh, for their employees. And uh, it, during the you know next many years, they ended up building uh, dwellings for I think it was 350 uh, employee families. Right. So they also had a company store and company school. And I think library. there's a country. I think Tennessee Ernie Ford. Sang a song about a company store. Right. If I'm not mistaken. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. uh, just like the Chicago stockyards, and a lot of those, um, a lot of those houses, duplexes, triplet, triples, quadruples, uh, quadruples right. they're still standing. Yes, they are. They're still yeah. standing. They're still being used as either condominiums. No, they were or, sold uh, back no, in the '50s and '60s. But currently. To a, to employees, yep, and they've stayed in in the family or been sold on the open market. But I don't think any of them are condominiums. They haven't been condoized. Nope. Hmm. No. Okay. Um, do you know if any of the original owners are still involved with those? Out of I'm, curiosity. I'm, yeah, I'm sure there are. Um, some of the names you still hear about town there still residing on Spooner Street and you know, places like that, which right. are company houses. Right. I've actually been in a couple of them for my work, and um, they're very well built. Extremely well. They're not, uh, they're not shoddily no. constructed Cordage, at all. Cordage did it right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, another thing, um, you say he came up here. Born Spooner come up here to start to get away from using slave labor. And ironically enough, a lot of the materials, a lot of the twines and baling rope that he had went back down south for baling cotton. Right. You had to bale cotton. Right. Which ironically enough is had slave labor, right? Slave labor. Right. Correct. Nothing he could do about that, but that's just the way the... But pretty quickly they switched over to things like manila and sisal. For fibers. Who are we talking about? Up here? Yep. Cordage? Mm hmm Okay. And vanilla, you know, all of the raw materials basically had to be imported or transported in. There's right. nothing naturally grown in the area. Right. So manila came from the Philippines and was the, the backbone of rope making back in those so days. So he must, his backers, when he got funding, you know, you have to, it's like you do nowadays, you have to get backers and people want to buy right. into you. Your company, um, a lot of the merchant sh ship is up there. Um, 
I can't think of the names right now. Forbes, Forbes up in uh, Milton. Right. Right, the Forbes Mansion, uh, Crown and Shield, Weld, mm -hmm. Wells. I believe they were backers of this company to some extent. Yeah, the, those aren't the names I remember. Loring was the uh, one of the big ones, the Loring family, and they from maintained Hingham? their uh, influence you know, for many, many okay. years within the company, being president and various offices on the board of directors. Well, they certainly would have sold their, sold their product to those people that I mentioned. Right. Because they were shippers. They right. owned ships. Right. They sold to the shippers. They sold to the shippers. Yeah. Right. I'll fit their shipping. The, the initial fiber, when they started, came in from uh, Russia. It was Russian hemp. And uh, they made a buy, and that's where they started making cordage, was with Russian hemp. Okay. And then eventually uh, it switched over to the Philippines and uh, Sisal coming out of the uh, places like Haiti and that area. Okay. Another place they, I read um, one of the books, they, um, they made ropes f uh, for lariats. They made lariats. Correct. Lariat ropes. Plymouth was put a lot of time and effort into developing uh, lariat rope. And most people think it's just a particular size of rope. A piece of cotton. Yeah. cotton. No, it's no. a totally different animal. Totally different. It's manila. Uh, it's been waxed, heavily waxed with weighted wax. Are we talking about the lariat rope? Yep. Okay. Uh, which gave it the weight. It's kind of like fly fishing. Yeah. used a weighted line to uh, sail it out into the distance, and that's exactly what you did with lariat rope. You needed some weight to throw it through the, uh, the wind and air. And so it didn't collapse. Else. And of course, the wax also gave it the, uh, the ability to form a loop and stay a loop. You know, rather than just collapsing as some of the softer lays of rope would do. Right. So, Plymouth was uh, the leader in lariat rope for many years. The uh, Cowboys used to buy a, a lariat this year and put it out to age for the, for a year. Really? And next you don't year, use it right out of the box? You don't use it out of the box. <laughs> and then next, next year they take the aged one off and put another one on to age, usually in a big frame out in the backyard out in the sun. Really? Yeah. That's interesting. Um, and another thing they've done, he, one of their uh, things they're known for is they supplied the rope that rigged the uh, schooner America that won the America's, that the America's Correct. Cup right. is um, named for. Right. They supplied all the rope for that. And they also did the uh, when they reconstructed or refurbished the Constitution back in, I think it was the 1920s, uh, it was all refitted with Plymouth Cordage rope. Now that surprises me because uh, my family members were working there back then at the Charlestown Navy Yard. So why did Plymouth Cordage get that job and no, not the government? I'm not sure I know the answer to that, but uh, what do you we, think it we'd is? like to think it's quality. Quality? Yep. I mean, the. Up on the board there is the order for uh, cordage for the Constitution. Yeah, the rope chart. What, what would you call that? A uh, that list, that whole breakout. We'll take a picture of that later. Yeah. What would you call that? I think working it was the purchase just a, order. Just, that's a purchase order. Yeah. Working purchase order. The names of the ropes, the sizes, the yeah. lengths, yeah. the quantity of them. And there's a huge variety when you right. look at it. You, right. Everything twines everything. all the way up to the right. big ankle, ankle hawsers and everything else. Yep, yep. So we'll have to take a picture of that after. Fascinating, the fascinating. Okay, we're going to take a little break here. <laughs> 